So in this video, I want to talk about fairness in machine learning. Uh, so first kind of a terminology note. So I'm going to be talking about machine learning. Mostly what it will mean, except for one single slide, is supervised machine learning. So supervised machine learning, uh, also known as predictive modeling. So machine learning would be for larger data set, basically. Uh, so what that's about is you have a training set and in the training set, as we had, you have some predictors, you have some target variables. Uh, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out a model that would take in the input variables and predict the targets using the training set and you hope to apply it to new data. Uh, so on the right hand of the slide there, you have uh, a little bit of vintage statistics humor. Uh, so uh, basically kind of those would be kind of like the terminology, uh, 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 the terminology terms that would be used in machine learning. And this is what's used in statistics. So in this course, actually, we're mostly using the statistical uh, uh, kind of uh, vocabulary. So we're talking about models where in machine learning, some of the time you would be talking about networks in the in neural networks, if you've heard about those, uh, in the same way that we'll be talking about models in this course. Uh, you would be talking about weights when we talk about parameters. So those are the kind of A0, A1, A2, when you're computing A0 plus A1x1 and so on. Uh, you'll be talking about learning rather than fitting and so on. Uh, I should say this is kind of a joke, uh, uh, kind of from the 90s also. Um, and I'm not going to be explaining all of those terms. Uh, that would take uh, several more courses, uh, and probably you'd have to be on campus for those. Um, so uh, I want to also start with uh, kind of a disclaimer. That's a disclaimer that I kind of stole from from Moritz Hart. So uh, we're going to be talking here about kind of mathematical notions of what it means for a classifier for a model to be fair, um, there are kind of inherent limits to uh, that kind of approach to fairness, uh, because a lot of the time fairness is really about social context. It's not so much about uh, the math and kind of just approaching it mathematically is just not going to do it a lot of the time. Uh, so uh, a danger of math snobbery, according to Professor Hart, is um, thinking that we, by we, uh, he means like computer scientists, statisticians, are more rigorous than social scientists. Um, I actually think that's kind of true. But um, with that said, uh, it should be acknowledged, again, kind of social context is important. Um, so. Okay, so with that disclaimer done, uh, let's go to the running examples uh, for this lecture. Uh, so one of them is uh, a model that estimates the probability that a person will recidivate. So recidivate means uh, to commit a crime again. Um, so those systems are actually used all over the place uh, in the US. Uh, for example, as inputs to decisions that are still made by humans, but using kind of an algorithm, a model, if you like, that predicts whether the person will reoffend. And based on that, the judge, for example, will decide whether to grant bail or not. So there are really kind of significant real life implications for using those kinds of models. Uh, so another example uh, that you should be thinking about is if you're a bank and you're trying to decide whether to uh, extend a loan to someone, you might, again, just kind of use a uh, statistical model like the one that we made for the Titanic, for example, in order to predict whether a person will default on the loan or not. Uh, so of course, kind of credit scores are used throughout and those are not exactly kind of models, although in a way kind of a system that computes the credit score is in itself a model, right? But you can also think of kind of more sophisticated models than just credit scores. Um, so uh, the interest in the field of fairness and machine learning, so thinking mostly thinking about machine learning in a sense of supervised machine learning, so just systems that predict some kind of uh, some kind of outcomes for people 
Uh, it started with uh, this investigation by uh, ProPublica, so that's kind of a journalism outfit. Uh, and they looked into a specific system that was trying to estimate the, and is still, like it's still being used, is uh, trying to estimate the probability that uh, someone will recidivate, that, so a person was arrested and then they're kind of going in the system. Uh, so I want to show you a little bit kind of, uh, of the system. So basically they have the uh, defendant um, fill out this kind of form here. Uh, so the current charges and then you have kind of criminal history um, and then you have kind of various indicators. Uh, so here you have family criminality, you have, uh, you know, stuff like have you ever been a gang member? Are you now a gang member? Uh, stuff like that. As you see, it's actually kind of a lot of questions. And the idea of the system, so just like what we had with the Titanic, right? So you have questionnaires filled out, presumably that's what they had, not presumably, they actually had that. So they had questionnaires filled out by, by kind of a lot of people like that. And then for those people, they kind of found out what happened to them. So were they rearrested within the next two years or not? And then based on that, they made a system that predicts whether the person will uh, reoffend or rather kind of the, the thing that they're predicting technically is, will they be rearrested? So they might actually be innocent, but will they be rearrested? Um, so that's like that. Uh, so um, a lot of the time what would happen is defendants who are defined as kind of medium high risk are more likely to be detained. So it's a decision that is still made by a judge, but the judge is using the model in order to inform their decision. Uh, so uh, ProPublica found that by some measures uh, the system is racially biased, uh, but it's kind of important to say um, it's not as if race was an input to the algorithm, right? So uh, specifically uh, uh, the system was kind of in that sense at least was designed to be kind of neutral. Uh, so, uh, so that's kind of what it looks like. It's just like another, uh, so this is from North Point. That's the company that made the system. Uh, and that is kind of a sample output uh, that uh, a judge, for example, would see. So they would see kind of like risk for violence, for recidivism, uh, for failure to appear, uh, kind of, uh, I imagine if the person is on parole or something like that. Um, so how does the system work? Uh, so uh, it's a trade secret. Uh, we don't know exactly. However, what we do know is that a logistic regression model can make predictions that are very similar to what uh, the compass system is outputting. So while it might not be a logistic regression system, it's something that's very much like a logistic regression system. Um, so how well does it work? So uh, compass gives correct predictions about 65% uh, of the time, which is actually kind of like not a lot. And that's true approximately for uh, both uh, white and black defendants. Uh, so. Uh, here, I should say, we're mostly going to be focusing on kind of white defendants and black defendants. That's, of course, not everyone, uh, but um, uh, kind of the disparity is uh, kind of particularly stark there. Uh, so here's what Compass found, uh, sorry, so ProPublica found. Uh, so it found that black defendants who did not recidivate were incorrectly predicted to reoffend at a rate of about 45% but white defendants who did not recidivate were predicted to reoffend at a rate that's twice as small. So a quite large disparity. Uh, so similarly, uh, white defendants who did not recidivate were incorrect incorrectly predicted to not reoffend at a higher rate than uh, similar black defendants. So 
at this point, so this is kind of like a mathematical calculation, right? So uh, what ProPublica did is they requested data from uh, Broward County in, uh, in Florida, and they had the numbers and they figured out what happened to all the people uh, kind of in Broward County for a particular period of time. And this is what they found. Um, so at this point, we need to get into, okay, how do we measure the fairness? Like what should what should we be aiming at? And what we'll find actually is that you can come up with several definitions of fairness, which all have something going for them, but they're not consistent with each other. So before we get into the math, uh, we should say, so I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll give you kind of like the lay uh, uh, understanding of uh, what it is, and it's all complicated. There is kind of uh, various case law, stuff like that. Um, so uh, in the U.S. there are two uh, kind of uh, two ways in which a system that makes decisions and I deliberately say kind of a system that makes decisions because it could be that it's humans who make decisions it could be that technically the humans made decisions but they have like a rubric according to which they make the decisions or it could be that it's a computer system uh, in a way it kind of doesn't matter so one kind of uh, legal rule that exists in the US is uh, if there is uh, disparate treatment, that is illegal. So uh, strict scrutiny applies to that. Uh, so strict judicial scrutiny applies to that. So in some kind of cases, uh, you can kind of justify what you're doing if you're treating different people differently uh, despite kind of because of their protected characteristics but in a very kind of restricted set of circumstances that's basically illegal uh, so you also have a disparate impact uh, concept so disparate income impact does not kind of address whether there is intentional discrimination instead it addresses whether there is a disparity in terms of the impact of some policy. So one example would be the 80% rule with uh, disparate impact. So if there is a group that's hire, hired at less than 80% the rate of another group, that might be evidence of adverse disparate impact. So uh, that can and usually would be illegal, right? Unless kind of it is justified so the criteria for what counts as illegal are different for disparate treatment where it's intentional discrimination uh, versus disparate impact where it could still be intentional of course but it's not necessarily inten intentional um, there is also various tests used, uh, used so this is kind of I'm not a lawyer I'm not going to pretend that they know kind of uh, how all of that works but that's the basic lay of the land so that's legally so what about mathematically? So let's think about the system or classifier C. And let's say that we have a demographic A. So for example, A equals one and A equals zero are two different, uh, whatever, it could indicate race or sex or some kind of other protected characteristics. And for kind of simplicity, we we'll just say A is either zero or one, of course, it could be anything. Um, so, okay. So, one kind of thing that you could say is, well, C satisfies demographic parity, meaning it treats people the same, uh, kind of on, on its face, it treats people the same, uh, if the outcomes are the same. So, if, for example, the bank extends loans to 70% of people regardless of the demographics so like you look at separately at uh, white applicants you look separately at black applicants and you see that the rate at which uh, they're offered a loan is the same then you would say that that mechanism for offering loans or that policy or if it's a classifier that just outputs one and then the bank extends credit then just a classifier, you would say that satisfies demographic parity. So that is one kind of thing that uh, you could do. Now, you could argue, well, but maybe in some situations, 
the demographics are different, in that case you should not expect demographic parity. So that would be kind of the argument against demographic parity. The, de the argument for, and well, we should note that kind of legally demographic parity is kind of what disparate impact is getting at, although you could interpret disparate impact in different mathematical ways. Um, so the argument for is, well, like that seems just fair, is that everyone has kind of the same shot at uh, kind of getting the uh, positive outcome, like being granted a loan, or kind of have the same probability of getting a negative outcome, like being predicted as uh, uh, being likely to reoffend. So here is another criterion. So that's accuracy parity. So a, pre a classifier C satisfies accuracy parity if the prediction accuracy is the same for the different demographics, right? So it's so accuracy par parity is satisfied if the probability that I'll correctly predict whether someone will reoffend is going to be the same regardless of the demographic, for example. So um, here it's kind of harder to argue that that kind of uh, represents our intuitive notion of what's fair, I would think, because it's a little bit in the weeds. Uh, at the same time, one kind of thing that, uh, uh, that you saw is, so one thing that you see is, uh, for example, investigations into facial recognition technology, which again, you can treat as a classifier, right? So either it kind of identifies the face correctly or not. And what people found is actually uh, a lot of facial recognition systems uh, misidentify people of color more often than white people, okay? So that is a case of a disparity in terms of the accuracy. And that might be like not might but is actually bad too uh, despite the fact that that's not to do with kind of demographic uh, parity. So another thing and it might seem like we're getting in in the weeds here but actually no uh, this is actually important. Uh, so another one is true positive parity. So here the criterion is the classifier C must have the same probability of getting a correct yes, regardless of the demographic, right? So here we're just talking, let's say we're talking about a classifier that says, yes, extend a loan, no, don't extend a loan. So what you might argue is, well, some people just shouldn't get a loan. It wouldn't be like, like if, if they're gonna default, it's bad for everyone. But you wanna say, if you should qualify for the loan, then the system should discriminate against you based on uh, your, based on your kind of demographic characteristics, right? So, so what this gets at is, it's a probability of getting a correct yes, which means that that the number of people who should have gotten the loan because they would not default, and who got the loan out of just the people who should have gotten the loan because they would not default, right? So that's just talking about kind of, uh, and uh, Moritz Hart talks about it in terms of equal opportunity, right? So if you deserve a loan, well, I don't wanna say deserve, but like if you should get the loan because you would pay it back, then you should have an equal opportunity to get that loan regardless of your demographics. Uh, I think that's quite appealing. So the flip side of that is false positive parity. So that, so if we're talking of positive as uh, a kind of will reoffend in the compass system, right? So a false positive parity says, if you aren't actually gonna be rearrested, you should really have the same probability of being misidentified as being dangerous, regardless of your demographics. Uh, that's quite appealing too. So, the last thing that you could have is predictive value parity and for a binary uh, uh, classifier that's also calibration. So that's, it's the same probability of getting an incorrect yes, regardless of demographics, the same probability of getting an incorrect no, regardless of demographics. So that's 
uh, kind of more detailed than just accuracy parity. Uh, and that is actually a criterion that can be quite important. So uh, we'll talk about it in the next video, uh, one of the next week videos rather. So, okay, so back to Compass. So what ProPublica found is that the, the likelihood probability of a non-recidivating black defendant being assessed high risk is nearly twice as much of that of a white non-recidivating defendant. So that means that there is no false positive parity, assuming you say positive is will reoffend and negative is will not reoffend. Uh, at the same time, accuracy parity actually is satisfied. So again, ProPublica found that the probability of being assessed a high risk uh, is roughly the same uh, kind of So the probability that a defendant who is like assessed as high risk will be roughly the same regardless of race. Okay, so that implies accuracy parity and also predictive value parity. Uh, so uh, what people found out very quickly is that mathematically it's not actually possible to both have accuracy parity and false positive parity at the same time in general. So. It is possible if the two populations are exactly the same. So if the base rates, the proportions of people who recidivate are exactly the same, then you can do it. But otherwise, it's just not possible. Uh, in fact, if you're talking about any of the uh, criteria that we discussed before, you can only have one. You can't have any two of them satisfied at the same time unless the base rates are exactly the same. So here's kind of like a quick argument for why this is. So this is just like an example where it's not possible, but it generalizes uh, uh, to kind of all other cases where the base rates are not the same. So let's say that you have uh, this kind of setup. So you have people who are low risk and you have people who are high risk. So of course, like in practice, it's not binary, right? Like you have a continuum. Also, like what does it even mean to say about the person that they're high risk? But whatever, like let's assume that that's like that. And let's say that we have two groups. So one group has a 40-60 split of low risk to high risk. And another group has a 50-50 split of low risk to high risk. So imagine that we made a system that can actually perfectly identify who's low risk and who's high risk, okay? So what's gonna happen in this kind of situation? Well, so for, for group A will correctly identify the high risk people. Of course, we identify the high risk people doesn't mean that they won't reoffend, just mean that they, uh, that, that they will reoffend rather, just means that they're likely to reoffend, right? So for group A, we'll predict that 60 will be arrested and we'll be wrong about 20%, so 12 of them. So for group B, we'll predict that 50 will be arrested, so these 50 people, and we'll be wrong about 20% of them, so 10 of the 50 won't be, okay? Uh, so similarly for group A, we predict that 40 will not be rearrested, and out of those 40, we'll be wrong about 10% of them, so the error rate for group A is going to be 16%. Uh, so in group B, it's 50, and so 20 so tw so we'll be wrong about 20% of the 50 that we said uh, will be rearrested, and we'll be wrong about 10% of the 50 who will say will not be rearrested because they're low risk. So this works out to 16% error rate for group A and 15% error rate for group B. So accuracy parity is not satisfied if we do it like that. So, and like here I set it up so that the differences are kind of small, but larger differences in error rates will lead to larger discrepancies. Now, if we wanted to insist on accuracy parity and we wanted to equalize the error rate, that would mess up the false positive parity. 
So here right now we do have false positive parity, right? Because for group A, we predict that those people are high risk. For group B, we predict that those people are uh, high risk. And, oh, sorry, so we'll predict that those are low risk. So, so we'll predict that those are low risk and of them, 10% will be rearrested. And we'll predict that those people are low risk. And again, we'll be wrong 10% of the time. So, and similarly for high risk, so both false positive parity and false negative parity is satisfied, but accuracy parity is not. So we could try to equalize the error rates, right? So we could just say, well, like we are, so we can't get group B more correct than we already are, but we can kind of mess up how correct we are about group A by just sometimes intentionally messing up, right? So we can say, well, like I'll just choose someone at random and I'll flip my prediction for them. And then I'll predict at a slightly worse rate than I was before. And you can kind of make the error, rate, error rates be equalized this way. Of course, like it doesn't make sense to do so, but in principle, that is possible to do. So, so one thing to note here is that we were assuming that we have perfect information about who reoffends and who who does not reoffend, and the only uncertainty is just inherently kind of like some people who are actually high risk. Well, maybe you know, uh, maybe they they'll kind of quarantine themselves and won't kind of commit crimes, right? Uh, but um, and there is like some chance of that, but actually kind of the uh, all of those calculations are only as good as the data so if for example there is bias as far as who gets arrested then an arrest in group a and an arrest in group b just don't mean the same thing so even if we have uh, a false positive parity false negative parity it might be that there is bias in the arrest numbers and in fact uh, kind of it's known that you know uh, so, so uh, some neighborhoods, uh, and that's that kind of that's kind of broken down by race. So some neighborhoods are over policed, uh, and people there are just more likely to be arrested regardless of uh, whether they committed a crime, right? Just because there's more police presence, uh, maybe the police policy is that uh, they arrest people for kind of anything. Uh, that might be an infraction. Uh, so if the data is bad, kind of all of this goes out the window. So let's go back to demographic parity. So again, kind of a class for C satisfies accuracy parity if uh, the probability of saying yes and no is the same regardless of A. Uh, but we're talking about demographic parity, so just the same percentage of people get a yes, uh, regardless of demographic, right? So it seems appealing, but there, there are problems. So for one thing, it does not rule out kind of the thing that I alluded to just before. It does not rule out accepting just random people in group A or like indicated in those at once, and then taking just the qualified people in group B. So here I'm thinking about kind of a system that screens job applicants or something, right? So you can say, oh, I want to like equalize, like do uh, so, just like get demographic parity, but nothing prevents you from doing something like this. Um, and again, if the base rates, uh, if the proportion of people for whom the correct answer is one are different across the different groups, then demographic parity actually prevents you from correctly predict or like if you want to satisfy demographic parity then you are actually prevented from saying c equals y in the sense of predicting the right thing for every person which also seems in some ways unappealing accuracy parity unlike demographic parity does allow you to do, to predict perfectly for everyone if you can do that, right? Because if your accuracy is 100% for uh, kind of uh, all demographics, then as far as satisfying accuracy parity, you're good. Uh, so it discourages laziness, right? So um, 
what we mean here is uh, the thing that we alluded to before when we were talking about different error rates for facial recognition applications, for example, right? So of course, like you could just degrade performance for some demographic in order to achieve accuracy parity, but more likely, like if we're talking about facial recognition technology, you'll just try to do a better job for groups for which you are not doing as well in terms of the accuracy. Um, so uh, it is still the case that even if you have false negative uh, accuracy parity, you don't have to satisfy false positive uh, uh, and negative uh, and false negative parity at the same time. In fact, in general, you wouldn't. And one thing again that you might do is you might say, "Oh, like you know, uh, I'm rejecting all those qualified women, uh, but I can just make up for rejecting qualified women by accepting unqualified men, which will make the error rates for both women and men low." So about the same, but that's obviously kind of like not what you want. So true positive parity we already discussed. So the argument for that is kind of like the equal opportunity of, uh, argument, right? So you want people who actually should get the job or should get the loan or whatever to have an equal shot at getting it. Uh, so the kind of the arguments against kind of each one is like if you want this you can't have the others so Another kind of thing that you might imagine as a definition of fairness is what's called fairness through unawareness So basically that's a model the model is allowed is basically not allowed to use uh, any demographic information so the problem with that, so it's appealing because, uh, and of course, like there's always arguments for and against, but kind of the argument would be, well, like if you're not looking at the characteristics, you can discriminate based on that. Now that's not exactly true. So a lot of the time you can infer information based on, for example, the address of the person, right? Because, uh, uh, because kind of, uh, neighborhoods can be different in terms of their demographic makeup. Um, so it, it is not going to necessarily lead to any other notions of fairness that we discussed before. So Compass, for example, does not contain any demographic information, does not use it. Um, so, um, yeah. So again, kind of the point to make is all of this discussion assumes that we actually are able to measure outcomes in an unbiased way. So if your outcomes are measured in a biased way, then uh, kind of everything goes out the window more or less because uh, the bias is built into the data. So the only thing that doesn't go out the window is the notion of fairness that does not consider kind of the labels, which is just demographic parity that you can still get. So uh, what are kind of some sources of unfairness that are not about kind of explicit discrimination? Um, so one kind of situation that occurs is sample size disparity. So that is the kind of thing that, exp that explains, for example, um, uh, that explains why uh, facial recognition technology works really well with white men, but maybe not as well with black women. Uh, that's just the kind of in part that's just about the sample size. So they're like in the data sets that were used in order to make those systems. And the systems, again, kind of simplifying just a little bit, the system is basically like I have a whole bunch of those faces and I have labels associated with them and I want to predict the correct labels. So in the same way that we would predict in the Titanic, kind of survive, did not survive, we would predict does this image contain a face or does not contain a face. And if for certain demographics you're undersampling, you don't have enough data, then uh, with our system you built, it's just not going to get uh, the answer right for uh, those faces as often. Um, so uh, an argument kind of, so this is kind of like an optimistic thing because this is eminently fixable, right? So 
checking algorithms for the different notions of fairness, even if they're not consistent with each other, which makes kind of all of them somewhat questionable, uh, would make companies that make those system kind of adjust and just do better, for example, by collecting more data about uh, kind of uh, all the potential users. So another source of unfairness, which is uh, kind of more difficult to deal with, is what we alluded to before, that's biases in the data. So if the data collection procedures are biased, uh, if so for example, if uh, kind of uh, the way police uh, perform arrests is biased, uh, if then, <clears throat> then basically you need to somehow be able to adjust for that. Um, so, Another kind of more abstract situation would be about kind of decisions about how to measure data. So you might imagine kind of uh, admission tests that are biased culturally. Uh, so uh, in that case, kind of it's an unfair test. So decisions made on that uh, and predictions made based on that would be unfair. Um, so um, another kind of uh, example here, and this is a little bit different from the situation where we, where, that we were discussing because this is about uh, kind of systems that are built by kind of hoovering up a lot of text and then using it in some ways. Uh, so extant data, uh, a lot of the time would be, uh, would be biased. So for example, uh, uh, like if you look at associations between uh, kind of pronouns and professions or like just men and women professions uh, you would see that like men is often associated with computer programmer like more more often than uh, than kind of woman would be associated with computer programmer for example uh, and there are ways to uh, kind of address those biases in extant data if, uh, if you're using that so to be clear in this course we have not discussed how to use a large corpus of text for anything, but just so that you're aware, there is uh, there uh, there is research on that, including actually research from uh, Princeton. Um, so uh, yeah, so as uh, so kind of what we've been getting at is uh, so uh, this this quote uh, from uh, from uh, Maciej Zaglowski. Uh, machine learning is like money laundering for bias. It's a clean mathematical apparatus that gives the status quo the aura of logical inevitability. The numbers don't lie. Um, so one last thing that I wanted to mention for this lecture is uh, this paper. So this would be more relevant to uh, uh, those of you who are going into uh, software development and stuff like that. Is this paper, uh, uh, so model cards for model reporting. Uh, so I'm proud to say that uh, uh, so Deb Raji actually was uh, in my introduction to Python class uh, in um, I believe 2015 and uh, now she uh, wrote the famous paper. Um, so basically uh, what this paper argues for is kind of any software system that makes decisions should be audited uh, kind of after the fact but here they give kind of a methodology for kind of looking at the potential impacts, looking at the potential disparities. So give that a read. Uh, so what are the takeaways? So um, from this lecture, so most fairness measures are not compatible. So we can just say, you know, we want this or that because there are arguments for every one of the uh, fairness measures. So uh, enforcing algorithm fair, algorith or algorithmic fairness, so this is the same as fairness in machine learning, it can reduce the classification accuracy of the algorithm, but uh, it might be that you can actually do better by, for example, collecting more data. Um, so this, uh, so the kind of, it's, it's an important topic, fairness in machine learning, but it's important to see that like it's not super important. So the way people use the algorithms is probably more important than kind of the formal criteria for uh, uh, what's fair or not, because all of those criteria are uh, imperfect. Uh, so, and inconsistent. 
but I would say that like if you're making decisions about uh, you know uh, about deploying a system like that or about uh, implementing a system like that you should definitely consider uh, kind of the various fairness criteria consider the implications of what you're doing